Good morning, everyone. Lindsay just said, my favorite hero in that sequence is Mario. Yeah. Personally, I like Terrell Davis, but you can choose who your favorite hero is. You know, there's a lot of ways you can begin a sermon. You can start by asking a question, maybe by telling a story or sharing a personal experience. <clears throat> Some preachers start a sermon by simply saying, open your Bibles with me to the following text. One way to start a sermon is by speaking a phrase or a sentence or telling a story which is meant to grab the attention of your audience, to pique their interest. You're assuming that this would cause them to want to pay attention to what you're about to say. Because you know there might be people in the room who are less interested in opening the Bible than others, or perhaps have had a difficult week. Some who are there out of obligation or maybe just curiosity, and you'd like to bring them along with you as you open the Bible. I love that this room is filled with people who are all over the map. Some of you may feel like you're here out of obligation today. Some of you might be less interested in the scriptures than some of us. I'm so glad that you're here. Some of you, many of you, the moment we say, open your Bibles with me, we've got you. I love that about you. I also know that some of us walk into this room today after a wonderful week, and we're just thrilled to be with the people of God, to be able to celebrate all that God has done in our life and give thanks to him. Others of us are here after a, a tough week or a traumatic time in our life, and we just need to be encouraged, reminded about the love of God for us, listened to. Maybe we just need a hug. I'm glad you're here. And our prayer is that as we gather each Sunday with diverse backgrounds, experiences, expectations, differing levels of interest about spiritual things, our hope is that most of all, God would get our attention and that he would speak to us in the middle of whatever we're facing or up against. And that if he does get our attention, that he would work in ways in our life that only God can. When the people of God gather, God gets to work. And we're praying, especially this coming year at the Boulder campus, that God would do a great work here amongst us. That he would bring more people here to the Boulder campus of Calvary. That he might stir in your heart to invite friends and neighbors to join with you who may have differing levels of interest about Jesus. And that we would gather in the name of God to worship him, to pray, to open his word together, and that in the middle of all of that, God would do a work here and bring more people to faith in his son, Jesus. As we continue our series today called Unsung Heroes, we're going to look at some events that happened in the New Testament that describe how God got the attention of a woman named Lydia. God got her attention in such a profound way that it completely changed the course of her life and I would say, I think, without exaggeration, that it changed our world forever. Do I have your attention? Maybe, maybe not. How about this? Open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts is in the New Testament, which is the second part of your Bible. It follows four biographies about Jesus of Nazareth. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all tell of the historical detail surrounding the birth and life and ministry and miracles of Jesus. They describe the messages that he preached, the healings that he brought to people in need, his promise that he would die, and then on the third day, come back to life. And those gospels document about how Jesus kept his promise, that he died on the cross for our sins, and after three days, he rose from the dead. The book of Acts picks up where the Gospels 
left off. Right after the resurrection of Jesus, and the book of Acts documents how the church came to be. The group of people who believed that Jesus was the Son of God, that he died to save them, and that he was indeed raised on the third day. It follows the growth of the church, which began in the city of Jerusalem, where Jesus died and rose, and then to the area around the city, which is known as Judea, and then to the wider region known as Samaria. And then how the church was established to go to the ends of the earth, even one day to Boulder, Colorado. The main characters of the book of Acts are the earliest followers of Jesus, well-known names like Peter, James, John, Stephen. Their work is the primary focus of the first part of the book, and then it shifts to a man named Paul. Paul had previously been a persecutor of the church. He was a Pharisee, which were some of the most important religious leaders of the day, and he had worked at one time to stop the growth of the early church. And then he had a life-changing encounter with the risen Lord on the road to Damascus. Paul met the risen Lord Jesus. Jesus revealed who he truly was to Paul. And then Paul became one of his most devoted followers, one of the most influential early leaders of the church, and ended up writing most of the New Testament. Paul traveled throughout the ancient world, sharing the good news he had learned about Jesus with others. He took a few trips, and Acts chapter 16 is in the middle of his second missionary journey. We'll pick up the story in verse 11 of Acts 16. It says, So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis. I want you to notice that it says here in verse 11, we made a direct voyage. Luke is the author of the book of Acts, and he joins with Paul and some others to journey on this second missionary journey. So the details of what happens in Acts chapter 16 that we're going to study together today, Luke was present for. He's an eyewitness of the situation that happened there. Luke was a medical doctor. He also wrote one of the gospels. He was a traveling companion of Paul's, and so he's with them here. Verse 12 says, and from there they went to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. Philippi was in modern-day Greece. It was named by Philip II when he conquered the city about 350 years before Jesus was born. Philip II was the father of Alexander the Great. He seemed to think he was important enough that he should name cities after himself. Luke describes Philippi as a leading city. Many scholars think that's because Luke was from Philippi or lived there, and so he's kind of a homer for his own town. Whether or not that's true, we do know that Philippi was a strategic place because of its location in the Roman Empire. As it says, it was a Roman colony. There was a very strategic and important Roman road that ran right through the middle of Philippi called the Via Ignatia. That allowed it to participate in trade with the wider Roman Empire, and it was about 10 miles away from the Aegean Sea, so it could receive trade routes that were on the Aegean Sea. One of the New Testament letters that Paul wrote was to the church in Philippi. And what we read about here in Acts chapter 16 is the beginning of that church. It began, verse 13 says, on the Sabbath day, when we went outside the gate of the city to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke, who were with him, went to a place of prayer, it says. This probably means that the Jewish community in Philippi wasn't large enough to have a synagogue. In order to have one in a place, there needed to be at least 10 Jewish men there. And if there wasn't a synagogue, then local Jews would gather in a place together on the Sabbath and still participate in religious worship, similar to what would happen in a synagogue. So Paul, along with his other companions, was there with them. And he found this group of women who were praying together on the Sabbath, by the river, and he spoke to them about Jesus. 
One who heard us, Luke says, was a woman named Lydia from the city of Theatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Lydia was not local to the city of Philippi, but was from the city of Theatira, which is several hundred miles away in modern-day Turkey. She was a very successful woman, a seller of purple goods, which is why our heroine here has a purple cape. You like that? You may know that in the ancient world, purple was a very difficult color to manufacture, which meant it was reserved for the wealthy. That's why purple is often a color that's associated with royalty because of its rarity. And the region of Theatira, where Lydia originated from, was known for its ability to manufacture purple goods and distribute them around the Roman Empire. Perhaps Lydia would travel between these two cities for business. We learned she owned a home in Philippi. So while she wasn't originally from there, she spent a great deal of time in the city. And the text says that Lydia was a worshiper of God. This is the way that non-Jews who practiced Jewish traditions but weren't fully Jewish converts were described, worshipers of God. They still followed Jewish customs. They still had many Jewish beliefs, but they weren't yet fully converted Jews. And so they were kind of on the periphery of their religious community. We don't know before this day that we read about in Acts 16 how committed Lydia was to her spiritual beliefs, but we know that on this day, on this Sabbath, she had chosen to gather with other women to pray together. And then what happened? The text says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Paul shared with Lydia and the other women there the message of salvation that is found in Jesus. And then we read in verse 15 that Lydia became a follower of Christ. It says, after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. She was baptized, which is the mark of obedience for all followers of Jesus. So Lydia goes from perhaps being on the fringe of her faith community, not a fully devout Jew, but simply a worshiper of God, all the way to being a follower of Jesus. And she took some steps along the way to get there. And I'd like to look at four of them with you from our text today. And maybe some of these steps that we see in the life of Lydia on her journey to becoming a follower of Jesus would be some steps that we might be able to imitate and take away from her story and make them a part of our own. First, did you see that Lydia gathered with the people of God? It says in verse 13, On the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Lydia gathered with the people of God, which is a good place to be. I'm glad you're here today gathered with us. When Lydia gathered with them, who knows what she expected that day? Maybe she had had a difficult week. Perhaps she had had a wonderful week and she just wanted to be with other like-minded people. Either way, when the people of God gather, that is often the time when God gets to work. Now, we might have in our mind a gathering of the people of God on this scale. That's probably not what it was like by the river. It was a small gathering. That's what many of the gatherings were of the early Christians, small. Jesus says, whenever two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. It's a good reminder for us that as we gather here on Sunday morning, that God is present with us. As we gather together as a part of life group, or if we gather together with another person to pray together, or to share what's going on in our life, Jesus is present there with us, which means he has an opportunity to work in our life. And that's what we pray happens when we gather together. We want the gathering of God's people to be one of the central focuses of our life together as a church. It's why it's a part of our mission statement, that we are building Christ-centered communities of people who are fully devoted to loving God and loving others. 
We want Jesus to be the center of our gatherings, both on Sunday mornings and throughout the week. And one of our shaping values as a church together is loving relationships. That we believe God does something when we gather together in his name, when we care for each other, when we love one another, when we commit ourselves to pursue authentic community, God can do a work there. And we would love for every person who is a part of Calvary to be a part of a loving community. Maybe it's a life group. Perhaps it's a Bible study. Maybe going on that women's hike that Patrick mentioned earlier would be a chance for you to be able to meet some new folks who are here at Calvary and gather with them and be a part of the gathering of God's people. The author of the book of Hebrews said it this way in Hebrews 10 verses 24 to 25. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need each other. We need each other whether we've had a thrilling week or a traumatic one. And that's why we want to encourage one another to follow Lydia and gather together with the people of God. As I said earlier, we're praying that more and more people would come to Calvary this fall. So many people would come that we would have to host another service. That there just wouldn't be enough room in this room for everybody who is a part of our church to gather. And you're an important part of that. We're praying that we can open up space for people in our community to come, like Lydia did, and gather with the people of God. It's an important step on the path to following Jesus, and maybe it's an important step for you to take, to gather with the people of God. Okay, second, Lydia heard from the Word of God. It says in verse 14, Lydia heard from us. One who heard from us was a woman named Lydia. Now, what did she hear? It doesn't tell us here in Acts chapter 16 the message that Paul preached to her, exactly what he said about Jesus and what he spoke that day by the river. But we have a pretty good idea based on the rest of the book of Acts, which document a number of Paul's messages that he spoke in a number of different places, and of course, the letters that he wrote about the kind of message that he would have spoken. In fact, later in Acts chapter 16, in verse 31, we hear probably what is the summary of the message that Paul gave. There's three characters that we're introduced to in Acts chapter 16. The first is Lydia. They're all in the city of Philippi. The second is a young slave girl who is most likely possessed by a demon. And the people who enslaved her used this demonic possession that she had for their irreputable gain. She was able to be a kind of fortune teller. And people would pay them to hear this young slave girl tell their fortune. And she seems to be converted in Acts chapter 16. The third person is a jailer in the city of Philippi. Because Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke helped this young woman who had been enslaved to hear the truth about Jesus, it enrages the local people and the owners of that girl. And so they go to the authorities and they tell them about the ruckus that Paul and his traveling companions are causing in the city and they're arrested and taken to jail. And one night, Paul and Silas in prison in Philippi are singing hymns together. And in the midst of their little hymn sing, God makes an earthquake which shakes the prison so violently that the walls shake and the handcuffs and shackles that are holding Paul and Silas fall off of them. It wakes the jailer up and he is so terrified about what has happened that he says to them, what must I do to be saved? And here's what Paul and Silas tell him in verse 31 of Acts 16. They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This is about as simple of a summary of the gospel as we have. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. We don't know if that's exactly what Paul spoke to Lydia, but probably something like that. Believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Believe that Jesus left heaven and came to earth on a mission to die on a cross, to pay the penalty for my sins and yours, and then on the third day to be raised. Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. This is the message of the gospel. The message that Paul traveled around ancient 
the ancient world sharing with people so that they might place their faith in Jesus. And it's perhaps the message that he spoke to Lydia that day and that she heard. This is one of our commitments at Calvary too. That each Sunday we would hear from the word of God. As we open it up together that his voice would be the one that speaks most loudly that we would hear what he wants to communicate to us. Maybe you're here today and you've never heard this message before. And I would say that God is speaking to, his, to you through his word by saying, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That is the message that God clearly wants you to know today. And God speaks to us in a variety of ways through his word. And we want to be a people that live under its authority, that hear from him, that listen to his voice and follow his leading as he speaks. So maybe that's a step for you to take, like Lydia did, to hear from the word of God. Not only here on Sunday mornings, but perhaps that is in a life group or a Bible study or in your own personal time of opening up the scriptures and hearing from God's voice. You could start this week by reading one of the gospels, one of the stories of the life of Jesus. You could read a psalm a day this week. That could be a simple step you might be able to take to hear from the word of God. So Lydia gathered with the people of God. She heard from the word of God. And then Lydia surrendered to the son of God. Lydia's life was changed forever when she surrendered her life to Jesus and publicly declared her faith in the Lord through baptism. And then she hosted Paul and his friends in her home. Earlier I said that, that this moment was a world-changing one. What is it about Lydia's personal conversion that would have any bearing on the rest of the world? Lydia was the first Christian convert in Europe, which I would say is a world-shaking event. Europe became the engine of global missions, and this is the very first place that the gospel was preached on the European continent, here in Philippi, by a river on the Sabbath. Lydia was the founding member of the church in Philippi, which was one of the most important first century churches. Paul wrote a letter probably 10 to 15 years later to the church that was gathered there in the city thanking them for their generosity, for the ways they had supported his work in other parts of the world to help the early church grow. The church in Philippi contributed to an offering for the church in Jerusalem, which had been struggling under the weight of persecution. And most likely, the church in Philippi met in Lydia's home. And then Europe would go on to fuel so much of the spread of the gospel throughout our world, even to where we are today in Boulder which in the first century, Boulder, Colorado, absolutely would have been the ends of the earth. Isn't it cool also that the first people in Europe to hear the gospel was a gathering of women? The early church and Jesus elevated women in their ministry in radical ways. Many of Jesus' closest followers were women, the first witnesses of the resurrection were some of those women. He appeared to them first before the rest of the disciples. And here when Paul reaches the continent of Europe for the very first time, he preaches first to a gathering of women. And then Lydia was one of the leading women of the early church. And God used her. That's the final step I see in Lydia's step of faith that Lydia served in the kingdom of God. After she surrendered her life to Christ, Lydia served in the kingdom of God. After she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. After Lydia surrendered herself to the Son of God, she became a servant in the kingdom of God, which is the next step of faith after surrender. Lydia undoubtedly used her leadership skills from her business 
to help lead the church in Philippi. The growth that happened there was due, I'm sure, in large part to her contributions. She was obviously successful in business given that her home was large enough that she could host these four men as well as her large household. And so it seems very likely that Lydia would have used her resources to fuel the growth of the first century church, to contribute to that offering that went to the church in Jerusalem, to help support the Apostle Paul in his missionary journeys. The letter that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi is a unique one. Many of the letters he wrote to the early church are to correct doctrinal errors in the churches that he knew about. And he wanted to help them follow Jesus more closely and accurately. There's, there's no apparent doctrinal error that Paul is addressing in his letter to the Philippians. Most of all, he just gives thanks to them for their contributions, for their faith, for their steadfastness. He uses the word joy over and over and over again to describe the way he feels about the Philippians. They were committed followers of Jesus and Paul loved them. And they were incredibly influential and supportive of his work in the first century. And as I said, her home was probably where the church met. The very last verse of Acts chapter 16, verse 40, describes after Paul and Silas have been able to leave prison, it says in verse 40, they went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Now I know that verse in our translation says brothers, but you have to remember anytime you see that word brothers in the New Testament, it's a gender neutral term, which would have included women. So it says they went and visited Lydia and they saw the brothers and sisters there. They probably visited the church that was already meeting in Lydia's home that had begun the day that they had met her on the Sabbath by the river when they told her about Jesus and she surrendered her life to him. The first century church was home-based. These were small gatherings. It was hard in the first century to be a Christian. And Lydia was an important part of the first church in Europe. So here's four steps of faith that Lydia took. Lydia gathered with the people of God. Lydia heard from the word of God. Lydia surrendered to the son of God and served in the kingdom of God. Now, before we close, let's circle back to the end of verse 14, which says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So those four steps we looked at, that's what Lydia did. But what did God do? God opened up the heart of Lydia. It was God who got in the middle of this moment in Lydia's life and opened up her heart to believe in him. Lydia absolutely took steps that day, and we might consider ways that we can intimidate, or excuse me, imitate what she did. But God was the one who did his work in her heart. This is the work of salvation, which belongs to God. He is the one who opens up hearts to believe. Hard hearts, soft hearts, all different kinds of hearts. God is sovereign in salvation. He is the one who allows us to pay attention to the message of the gospel, to believe in the Lord Jesus, to know that he is who he says he is. God is the one who in key moments in our life can grab our attention and communicate to us and speak to us in ways that change us forever. And that's what we pray happens each and every week as we gather together, that God would get our attention here on Sunday mornings, during the week in life groups, as we hear from him, that people might surrender themselves to the Son of God by his power and for his glory. God got Lydia's attention that day. I wonder if God has your attention this morning. I've been praying for you this week that God might speak to you as he spoke to Lydia that Sabbath morning 
that if necessary, he might get right in the middle of your circumstances and redirect your life, just like he did for Lydia. I'm sure many of us who follow Jesus could speak of very specific moments in our life when God really got our attention. I can think of one in particular in my life that was transformational for me. When I was a freshman at the number one university in the nation, CU Boulder, that's right, you know what I'm talking about. My freshman year, I think like many people, was really hard. I was away from my family. My high school friends were all over the country and I was lonely. I wasn't sure where to find my place. I wasn't really in a group of friends yet and I just felt really, really alone. And I had the blessing of growing up in a Christian home and faith had been an important part of my life. But up until that point, I wouldn't say that my faith had been my own. It probably was not the defining and most important thing about my life. And in the midst of this lonely period, I remember thinking about, I, I'm just so lonely. Everybody says college is the best four years of your life and I don't even really like it. And I remember it was as if God grabbed me by the lapels as I'm just constantly thinking about how lonely I felt and thinking about ways I can find new friends and get a new social group. I remember feeling as though God was saying to me, you need me. I knew in that moment that I needed more than anything, a deeper relationship with God. And that changed the trajectory of my life, the trajectory of my college career. That I felt like one of my purposes as a student was not only to learn academically, but to grow spiritually. And it was because of that moment of deep loneliness where I felt like God grabbed my attention and said, you need me more than anything. And I got involved in some campus ministries. My roommate invited me to come to church here at Calvary. I probably started paying closer attention to Tom's sermons. And over several years, I just kept coming back to that idea that I felt like God was saying to me, you need me. You don't need these other things you're seeing college students participate in. I'll provide friends and relationships and those things that are important, but most of all, you need to focus on me. In that moment, God absolutely had my attention. And it's possible he's trying to get your attention today. Just like he got Lydia's. Just like he got mine. Maybe he's trying to get your attention today about some of these steps that we saw that Lydia took. Perhaps for you it's gathering more regularly with the people of God on Sunday mornings. Perhaps it means this fall you're going to join a life group or a Bible study or a men's group. Perhaps it means you need to take a greater commitment in hearing from God's word on a regular basis. Maybe God has your attention today that it's time for you to surrender yourself to the Son of God, Jesus. Maybe God has your attention because he wants you to use your resources that he has given to you, your success in business or otherwise, so that you might be able to further the work of his kingdom here on the earth. Perhaps he has your attention because there's a habit you need to leave behind. Or there's a discipline you need to begin. Whatever it might be for you, when God has your attention, pay attention to him. I think those are the moments when God does his work in our hearts and in our lives. He might be on the move in your life. He might be at work in your life. He might want to change your life just like he changed Lydia's. So we're going to pray together. In a moment, the team's going to come and lead us in a few songs. And I would just encourage you, as we're singing together, that you might consider 
and actually ask God this question. God, are you trying to get my attention about something in my life? Would you reveal that to me, God? For my good and for your glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Lydia, for the way that you worked in her life to speak truth into her heart. I pray for any friend who's in this room today that you're speaking to now, God. I pray you would soften their heart and speak clearly about what it is you're trying to communicate to them. And God, if it would be your will that you might open up their heart. Perhaps, God, if you're trying to get our attention about something, I pray that that would be clear to us. That we would hear your voice and follow your lead and be obedient to your will for our lives, God. We're thankful for the work that you do in salvation, Lord. We pray for our friends and family who may not yet know you. We pray, Lord, that you would get their attention, open up their hearts to believe, speak truth into their lives. We give you thanks, Lord, for your love for us. We pray all of this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.